What's up guys, Doug Polk here, and today we're going to talk about what it's like to be a high stakes online player, a little bit about the ecosystem, a little bit about the day to day, who some of the best specialists are, and a couple of experiences that I've had personally. But before we jump into that, I want to quickly announce our new campaign, Rake It. The way this is going to work is simple. We got 20 of these bad boys, but we're only giving away 10. So if you want to win one, it's going to be signed by me. We're going to have a free copy of Joe Ingram's book, Chasing the Poker Dream. And we're going to be giving away a year annual subscription to the Upswing Lab. All you have to do is email this email on your screen, a picture or video of why more rake is better. And we've already been getting some pretty interesting entries. Myself, Joel Ingram, and the rest of Grind Nation were kind of on the fence about making this promotion. But then yesterday, PokerStars announced that Rakeback will be cut by up to 85% for some people, and we felt it was time to run our own campaign. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start to talk about high stakes online, talk about the lifestyle, talk about some of the specialists. And I do want to quickly say that I haven't spent the last year in that scene, but I did spend most of the few years before it, so I should have some pretty good perspective the way the whole thing works. I want to kick this off by talking about the two types of players that we see at high stakes online as far as the regs go. We see a group of people that all specialize in an individual game, we'll call them specialists, where they pick one game, they spend their life studying about it, they spend hours and hours and hours trying to get as good as they possibly can. And then we have people that play in a variety of games, you know, maybe even mixed games, but tend to jump between different pools. Now, over the last five years, we've seen a shift of the people that really specialized tend to be some of the only people that really manage to do well. I'm not going to count 8 game because that game is sort of a specialized game in its own way, but I mean, if you play three different games, let's say you play No Limit, Pot Limit Omaha, and Triple Drop, chances are you're not a winning player in the last five years because every game has a bar for how good you have to be in order to win. You know, there's not a ton of people playing high stakes in any individual game type. So you have to be pretty goddamn good to win in today's nosebleed environment. Now that means if you're splitting your time between studying some no limit, studying some PLO, studying, studying some triple draw, then whenever you play a specialist in any of those games, you have an inherent disadvantage because they get to spend way more time learning that game type as they have been for months or years prior. Now, there are some people that can manage to jump between games and do all right. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. One of the best examples is Isildur 1. Yeah, the thing about Isildur is when he starts to play certain specialists in certain games, he's not going to have an edge and it can be very costly. But how good Isildur is across the board, given how many games he plays, is actually extremely impressive. The problem is, if you continue with that style of, you know, that game selection, then yeah, you're going to get beat in the long run because the people you play have a huge advantage on you. They're preparing for that match all the time, whereas you're just doing it some of the time. In fact, I think if Isildur had just stuck to one or two of his best games and been more disciplined, he might have found a different amount of success than he ended up finding. There will be some other problems too, like bankroll management. Obviously, he's always trying to push it to the limit. But in just raw poker talent, it's kind of amazing how much of a fight Isildur could put up in certain games, given the inherent disadvantage of not being able to spend as much time there. Now, one of the cool things about the site High Stakes Database is that you can see both the results, but you can also see by game type, which is a pretty cool feature. And I want to start off by, by showing Isildur's uh, graph, just to kind of show what I mean. So this is his overall results on High Stakes Database. Um, and then also his results broken down by game type. And you can see that really epic time period when he was playing Durr, he won a few million off Durr, and then ended up losing it back in Pot Limit Omaha to Hastings, which definitely skews this kind of out of the gate. But you can see that Isildur is actually quite good at the draw games. I mean, he ended up losing, you know, a few million on the site, but he ended up winning four million in draw. And if he had just stuck to draw, then obviously things would have gone better for him. Uh, no limit, he ended up losing small, but you know a lot of it was off of dirt, and he ended up losing to uh, other people down the stretch. Definitely got a little piece of that myself. 
And you can see he's kind of like, you know, okay at 08. I remember he played a lot of 08. It was kind of swingy for him. Um, it just seemed like the main game he really needed to avoid was Pot Limit Omaha. Now, it's not exactly fair to say that entirely because since he, he was down 4.6 million, you know, he only lost another, well, I mean, I guess 1.8, 1.6 million. So it seems like if Isildur had just kind of realized some of these things out of the gate and picked his games more wisely, he could have won money on this, you know, on this account just by having not played Pot Limit Omaha, which is why it's really tough because when Isildur plays these people on Pot Limit Omaha, you know, they're studying Pot Limit Omaha. They're, they're working on their game, you know, constantly. And he has to work on draw. He has to work on 08. He has to work on NL. He has to work on 8 game. He has, you know, he has to work on so many different games that you're really just putting yourself in a position where you can't be successful in today's climate while you're trying to do that. Let's take a quick look at his poker stars as well. Now, his Poker Stars results actually contradict some of the full tilt results. Uh, his biggest winning game is 08, you know, and he was break even on full tilt, winning on stars. That's probably a strong game for him. Uh, he did win 1.1 million in PLO, which is second best game here. For some reason, there's a day where he won like 2.1 million, or I don't know if this is a month or, or whatever, but that's pretty nuts. Um, and draw ended up being one of his weaker games. So. You know, overall in this account, he did do well. There wasn't, weren't that many games he ended up getting crushed in other than draw. He lost about a million. But you can see, like, when you're trying to play all these different games and different opponents and swinging around, it's very difficult for you to play all of them well and make sure that you're playing in a game type that you're going to have an edge. Okay, let's move on to looking at someone else's. I've got another couple players that I think do a good job of playing, you know, a wide array of games. Uh, one of them is Joizo Alexander, uh, something Russian I'm not going to try and pronounce. And, you know, if you look at his different by game, he actually does play a wide array of different games uh, and has, you know, been very successful with it. He's like the 11th or 12th on the winner's list. So there are not too many people that managed to do this, you know. And even then, he did, you know, really make a lot of it in 8 game and draw and PLO um, while not really playing much No Limit at all. Um, but, you know, there are people that do manage to play a good array of uh, different games and, and be very successful with it. You know, we also see Ben Solsky, certainly good at a bunch of different games. And one of the most impressive things, I think, for, for Ben is that he's really good at No Limit and PLO, which are probably the most studied games, probably the toughest games to get to the top at because of how much work players put into them. So, um, you know, there definitely are players that can jump into a lot of different game types and, and be successful. They just have to be kind of careful with who they play, know where their strengths are, and kind of map their game selection around that. All right, let's go ahead and look at a few different specialists and see, you know, who are the best players in each individual game type. Here we have the graph for OTB Red Baron. You know, a nice smooth graph. He does play a lot lower, which isn't taken into account here, but we break it down by game, boom, no limit, hold him. This is kind of an interesting one. It's Yogi. He's one of the best, probably the best limit player, uh, which, you know, for high six heads up limit, given that it's basically solved, I don't even know what best means, but he seems to set the highest stakes and is willing to play a lot of people. And you can see, you know, over time, consistent winning graph. But again, we go to profit per game. Boom. All hold them fixed limit. Jeans89, a very strong pot limit Omaha player. He actually has been the biggest winner on Stars until about a month ago when Sauce finally passed him for most wings ever on Stars. But, you know, very nice, steady graph, constantly winning, clearly a favorite in the games. And if we look at them, you know, we can see just nice, steady profit in Pot Limit Omaha. Now that we've talked about a bunch of players, I want to talk about my personal experiences. So when I found myself in No Limit not really being able to play many opponents or really any opponents, I started to look to branch out and find new games. And the first game that I gave a shot was Pot Limit Omaha. I've always kind of liked the game of Pot Limit Omaha, but there was a mistake that I definitely made out of the gate, which was trying to play it before I was really ready to win at it. You know, it's tough for a lot of high stakes players, and I definitely felt, felt this, you know, myself, you play high stakes, you win a lot of high stakes, and you don't really want to start off playing like 1, 2, or 2, 4 when you're already playing one, you know, 100 or 200 plus because you're so well bankrolled for the higher stakes, you kind of want to get in there. Also, past that, I was kind of an idiot at some points. I want to pull up one specific day that I can vividly remember by showing you what my net potatoes were from one day to the next. 
I'm going to kick this off by saying that these numbers do not reflect anything other than potatoes and should not be interpreted as such. So as you can see here, uh, I have only a couple dates highlighted. I, I wanted to uh, show you uh, some numbers from 2013. You know, 2013 was a breakout year for me. I managed to go from um, you know, playing smaller, you know, mid stakes, maybe a little bit of high stakes to really taking on a lot of the best people in the world. Um, so I'm very thankful for that, but I, I hadn't amassed, you know, as many potatoes as some people might have thought a farmer of my caliber would have. So the two days in question here, remember I left the number 12th, uh, I made what ended up being like a really, really bad mistake. And essentially what happened was I had been winning a lot lately, the no limit tables, and I decided to play uh, Rui KO or Pepperoni F on full tilt uh, at heads up pot limit Omaha at 100, 200, and I learned a very valuable life lesson. The lesson that I learned was just because you have the potatoes to jump into a game and you know you can lose some, you're going to be okay, you've got all these other good things going on. The thing is, that that's a trap. It's a trap to look at it like that because you don't know when those opportunities are going to be gone. You know, a year from that day, roughly, or maybe even less, I had almost no games left I could play at all. So what happens if I just punt off my role in Pot Limit Omaha? Uh, you know, I'm going to be in a tough spot. I remember right after that game finished, looking at how many potatoes I'd lost and going, you know, leaving Shangri-La and just, it was like 5, 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. And like, I just remember walking around, you know, like just like got a coffee, just like trying to clear my mind, seeing like normal people like functioning around the street, like the street around me and thinking to myself, like, you know, just in my hoodie, just like eyes, just red, just, just exhausted, having lost all of those potatoes. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, like, I'm just like, I feel like I'm not even part of this world right now, like given like the pain that I'm feeling and the fact that. You know, it's my fault. I, I'm, you know, I, I accept responsibility for that, but that doesn't make it feel any better having to go through this. And I remember just telling myself, like, look, like, you know, we're going to, I'm, I'm going to learn from this. And in the future, I'm still going to probably have to try and play other games. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to try and learn how to play these other game types or else, you know, I, I'm not really going to have much of a future playing because, you know, I'm not going to have a lot of games I could play. And ultimately, I decided to play more tournaments where it's kind of more in my wheelhouse, which I think was a great move. But, you know, I had to expand to other areas because there weren't enough games for me. So, all in all, I guess I would say that, you know, if you're not a specialist, that's okay. But try and pick one or two and really stick to them. I think that's the single best thing you can do, particularly at high stakes when you're playing people that are very talented and have done a lot of studying. Pick one or two games stick with them and you're going to be a lot better off. Given that we did bring up a bunch of other people's graphs, I just wanted to show mine as well just to you know show you what I'm talking about. Um, so my full tilt graph, I ended up about 1.7 million in no limit. Uh, you can see the day where this occurred to me in, in full tilt or on full tilt. Um, it looks like it's like not even correct. Oh, it's actually by month. So I must have like won a bit that month and then like lost on that day or whatever. Uh, it's funny looking at that little dip and you're like, damn, Doug, you're like telling me like sob stories, like it doesn't even matter here. Uh, but you know, it, it did matter to me. Like that was, that was a very important day, a uh, very sad day for me that I learned a lot from. And uh, let's go ahead and look at stars as well. This is my stars results. Not very flattering in the pot limit Omaha. We ended up losing around 640K at higher stakes. I will say that uh, I won several hundred thousand playing lower that is not tracked. I mean, it would still suck. I mean, I don't know why I'm trying to make excuses here. I lost 640K. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you just, you just lose a bunch of money. You know, I tried to play higher and I lost. But again, my no limit, very good, obviously. Uh, my eight game is pretty good. Uh, my draw, my triple draw specifically, not that great. But, you know, gave my best. And at least the thing is about this, this, you know, period of time uh, where I lost this in Pot Limit Omaha, uh, I was winning at lower stakes and then was taking higher shots that went poorly. Uh, and then also I was studying a lot more of my game. I was working on, on some post-flop stuff. Uh, and I also had, you know, more potatoes. So, you know, th this I'm actually more okay with. I was doing what I, what I 
had to do to try and improve. And I also had a little bit of a tough time with it just because I think a lot of players assumed I was going to be really good at pot limit Omaha. And so the kinds of people I had to play were obviously very talented players. I think that this was actually, you know, if there's a responsible way to lose 600K in this graph, uh, I actually feel okay about this. I also want to quickly bring up the graph of a player that's known for beasting everything. Uh, I think he beasts the hardest in 08. Uh, he's got like a tidy 68K profit there, which is fairly nice. Uh, his main games he should look to stay away from, though, are uh, triple draw, definitely PLO, and uh, eight game, which, you know, is, is eight games. So as long as you stay away from that, this guy should be totally good to go. Now, before we go, I do want to talk about what it is like day to day as a high stakes player, because I think that that lifestyle, particularly an online high stakes player, is tremendously different than what a normal grinder's day to day is like. For me, I would fire up my tables, you know, after a couple hours of whatever in the morning, I'd fire them up and I would just sit as many tables as possible across as many sites as possible uh, with, you know, down to around the lowest table I'd be willing to play which would usually be around 5, 10, or 10, 20, or something like that. Uh, certainly days where it would be 20, 50 plus. If I was getting action where I knew there was one or two guys that might sit me, I would definitely sit 20, 50 plus, or maybe even 50, 100 plus, with my idea being that if I'm going to not have, you know, not be studying for this match, uh, I want to only be playing when it's significantly going to be worth my time. So let's say that we played a couple matches. I thought you were likely to play me again. Uh, I'd post up 5100 plus or maybe 2050 plus, and what I would be doing all day is studying. I'd be pulling up the hands, um, you know, your stats, going through like your game tree, going through my board texture, uh, going through all those kinds of things, deciding the way I was going to play that, you know, that opponent, how I was going to deviate from my strategy, and I'd be spending my day doing those things with, you know, a lower priority on trying to play. Now, when I went through periods of time where, you know, there weren't a lot of games going, I was generally waiting for more action, then I would just sit on my, a much, I'd cast a wider net, so to speak, and just play kind of whoever. And so sometimes during that stretch, I would play real low. I'd play like 3, 6, or 5, 10, or whatever. Uh, the main problem is, you know, if, if it was a better reg, I would, would not play them that low, because if you allow good regs to play you at small stakes, they just basically get to learn how you play for free. Well, not free, but you know what I'm saying, you know, much cheaper than at higher stakes. So sometimes I wouldn't take those matches specifically. Uh, but in general, I would be fine playing pretty low on the days where um, yeah, I didn't have action lined up. When you started to have more serious matches, like when I played Sauce, uh, like when I played Will Haas in 2014, um, you know, more, more serious matches where I knew they would play, then you just like don't even post the tables. You just spend every hour you can while you're awake studying to, to, to prepare for it. That's an aspect that I think a lot of players, well, I mean, you know, the people that get to high stakes, the vast majority of them have this kind of attitude. They, they look at poker like that. Some of them might spend it more on theory than like particular opponent uh, exploitation like I did. But in the heads up game types, it's much more about that of creating a good counter strategy because players tend to have weaknesses that you want to, you know, you really want to exploit. Whereas in like ring games and stuff like that, it's more about having a, a good overall strategy um, with some variation for your opponent. But when you have, you know, 30 opponents, you can't be like, all right, this guy's got a terrible turn check race strategy. I mean, you can, but it's just hard to get through that many people. So I think, you know, at least in the heads up format, it was always the play to try and study, prepare for those specific opponents, work on some of your, your theory too, work on your overall strategy, but kind of plan your day out like that. So your day would be really long, but it would oftentimes not include that many hands, which is why a hand number is misleading for high stakes players. You know, for example, that limit hold'em guy we looked at earlier, that guy sits all the time, just constantly all year, he's just sitting. You know, and he did not play that many hands because there are not that many people that still want to play limit hold'em because they know it's like basically solved. So you have to do a lot of sitting, you have to do a lot of studying. You're going to play for long periods of time. And one big thing is when you get that match that you are really, you really want to have, um, you got to just play it out. If you're the pro, if you're, if you're the specialist, you got to just play until they're done. You know, one thing that definitely helped me a lot through my poker career I have a really good ability to focus for long periods of time because I get into it, I get interested in it, and I'm really trying to, to, to create new strategies even far into a match. 
So I, I definitely feel I had a lot of opponents where the first few hours were closed or the first four hours were closed, and I eventually kind of cracked them because they got too much into like a s specific rhythm and weren't trying to think anymore. They were just clicking buttons and doing their strategy, but I was still making adjustments. So I think some of my best matches in my life were ones that went on for long periods of time. There are other people that are good in long matches, though, for sure. Another one that comes to mind is Daniel Cates, extremely good in that format. Um, but you have to know you have to know what you're like. You know, if you're not able to, to play hour four at a really high level, play three hour sessions. That's perfectly within your right as a poker player to do that. But keep in mind, if you're the pro and you're the specialist, that this could be your only shot. So sometimes you're gonna have to battle through that when you get that action and be willing to lose a lot because you never know when the next time you might get that match is. Overall, being a high stakes pro is very demanding takes a lot of hours, and it can be emotionally very devastating sometimes. But at the end of the day, as long as you pick good matches, study a lot, and know where you are on the ladder, you're going to be okay. Also, one last thing, if you're the 8th best player in a game type, I know this doesn't apply to many people, but I'm just going to say it anyway, make sure to play number 7 before you start playing number 3 or number 2. Because if you beat number 3 or number 2, all of a sudden you missed out on several opportunities to play people, and don't lose those opportunities. Take it one step at a time, work on your game, pick one, maybe two formats and get good at them, and then one day, maybe you'll make it to the top. That's going to do it for me today, guys. Make sure to hit that sub button, and if you like videos like this, leave me a message in the comments so that I can make more of them in the future.